Great stuff. Thanks, Gronje. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so uh, thanks very much for the invite. I, I was so looking forward last year to going back over to the Burren. It's, it's somewhere that I've been quite a few times and, and I, I really love it. Um, I kind of live on the opposite side. Uh, so if you were to just go due east, almost due east or northeast, um, I'm based in the southern part of County Down, uh, right on the Mourne Mountains. This is my kind of morning walk uh, at the beach in uh, Murloc, looking towards Newcastle and, and the Mourne Mountains. Uh, so uh, it's great to be part of this, this event again. Um, I've, I've been at the Learning Landscapes conference a few years ago and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be back again uh, in, the, in the not too distant future uh, over in County Clare. And now my screen has frozen. There we go. Um, so just to let you know that I'm, I'm based at Tullymore National Outdoor Centre. In my day job, I work for Sport Northern Ireland and, and I'm based here. My, my, my work is to strategically develop outdoor sports and outdoor recreation. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about my, my work in ENOS, the European Network, but um, you know, as, as, a, as a day post, this is, this, this is where I'm based. It's a beautiful setting. We have a, a great center. Uh, it was redeveloped in 2010. And um, in, uh, it was an old wooden building that had sort of gone, got very dilapidated and, and we, we've, we've now got this world-class facility. So if you're ever in County Down, do come and visit us, say hello, uh, drop into Tullymore, it's just on the edge of the Mourne Mountains. This, the center has been there for about 52 years um, and our focus has been on training leaders in the outdoors and developing skills, uh, but mainly training leaders. Um, so the people who take others into mountain environments, coastal environments, whatever, they, they come and do that leadership training. Uh, with us here at the centre. Uh, one of the things we are looking at is, is what could our remit be in, in, in the next 50 years, and particularly on an all-island basis, and we're working quite closely with Sport Ireland at the minute to look at that. And some of the things that are, are coming up, and this will probably be of, of interest to, to you guys, is, is that whole area of environmental awareness and engagement through outdoor sports and outdoor recreation, uh, looking at sustainability issues um, in, in outdoor recreation understanding what makes participants think, uh, how, how to engage others, particularly from socially isolated backgrounds uh, in the sector, um, and, and also just that whole area of managing risk and, and liability. So these are things that we're going to be exploring uh, over the, the, the coming years at the centre. So uh, by all means, keep an eye on our website, have a look at what we're doing, um, and uh, do get in touch. I'm sure, uh, you know, Gronje can pass on my email address. I'm more than happy for that if, if folk ever want to get in touch with me. So that's my kind of day job. Uh, my background is that I was uh, I trained as an environmental scientist, um, and then I worked for many years in the education authority, uh, running uh, outdoor and environmental education programs, particularly for primary school children, uh, but not exclusively. And, and I did that for about twenty odd years before I moved to the sports council. Um, but as as Gronje mentioned, my 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 main sport and my main passion has been sea canoeing and sea kayaking, and and particularly that whole area of doing journeys on the sea, and 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 leading others on the sea and connecting people with that amazing maritime environment that we have here on the island of Ireland. And I and I've paddled many times in County Clare, um, so I I know it uh, very well. So. What I'm going to cover this morning is a little bit of an introduction into this network, the European Network of Outdoor Sports, known as ENOS. And then I'm going to give you some information about the, the BOSS project that we did, the, the benefits of outdoor sports for society, um, which hopefully will be of interest to, to yourselves and something that maybe you could use in the future. Uh, and, and then I'll talk a little bit just about um, the whole issue of COVID and the outdoors and just what's been happening in some, some of the trends that we're seeing across Europe, but I'll give you some examples from here in, in Northern Ireland as well. Um, and, and I think none of that will be a great surprise to you. Um, okay, so uh, ENOS is, is this European network of outdoor sports uh, and, and our key message is that we're working together to promote outdoor sports across Europe. Uh, it's a voluntary network. So as I mentioned, my, my full-time job is with Sport Northern Ireland and um, all of us involved in ENOS on the board of ENOS are, are volunteers. Uh, we have no paid staff, um, but most of our organizations are very supportive at releasing us to do little pieces of work for ENOS. So my organization is, is very content that I'm, I'm currently chairman of ENOS and, and I, I do spend a bit of my, my work time, but also quite a lot of my personal time uh, involved in, in the network. Um, I've, I've gone, I've gone on one too many there. Um, just to give you a bit of background, uh, 
there, there's a, a document that's produced every three or four years by the European Commission, and it's called the Special Eurobar Eurometer, Eurobarometer. Um, and it's on the amount of physical activity and sport that people participate in uh, across Europe. And it looks at different countries and, and, and how much actually happens. But one of the things that, that uh, comes out of that is that um, most people who participate in sport and physical recreation um, do so informally and, and often in parks or the outdoors. Um, and, and that represents up to 40% of the overall levels of participation. So that's pretty significant. And yet, in 2013, uh, before ENOS was formed, no one was looking at the European Commission at the whole issue of outdoor sports. So what is an outdoor sport? Um, and, and we've kind of defined this uh, relatively clearly now for, for our network. Um, the first thing is that we, we say that it's an activity that has to take place or be carried out with a strong relationship to nature and the landscape. So you can see how this ties very closely with the learning landscape sort of uh, conference and, and, and theme. Uh, and it's all about dealing with natural elements rather than an object. So for example, we don't include golf uh, as an outdoor sport, even though it takes place in the outdoors, it is clearly a sport, but it's not what we would class as an outdoor sport uh, because it's, there's, there's this pitch that's been created um, and it's also about getting a ball into a hole. So it's not about engaging with the landscape particularly. We also include some activities that have their roots in natural places. So for example, climbing, some, a lot of people now climb on indoor walls. Um, so we, we still include that because hopefully the people then will be encouraged to go out into to the rock faces and, and, and climb in, in natural settings as well. And, and we also think it's about not changing landscapes and changing environments significantly. So, so one of the, the, the big discussions that we have regularly is about the whole area of skiing. So cross country skiing and ski touring where you're traveling through forests or, or across mountains on skis is definitely an outdoor sport. But then what about downhill skiing where you're in a mountain environment but there's been significant modification to that environment through the, the, the placement of toes and, and the pasting of the, 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 the route and setting up fences and all sorts of things. So really, is that an outdoor sport or is that on a pitch? Um, it, it's one we haven't quite resolved yet, but it's probably on the periphery of what we're looking at. But we're much more about this idea of, of the connection people have with nature. So we, we were formed in 2013. There was a, an outdoor sports conference in Slovakia. And, and at that time, we, we decided that there was a real need for a, a network. Th there are lots of European federations for specific sports. So rambling and canoeing and sailing all have European federations that represent their members' interests. But nobody was representing the range of outdoor sports, and um, particularly with the European Commission. So, so that's why we were set up. Um, was to do that. And we work now actually very closely with the European Commission Sport Unit. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, we have members from 13 different EU countries and we're very varied in our membership. So I work for the, 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 the Ministry of Sport in a sense in Northern Ireland, the, the, the Sports Council. Um, we have the French Ministry of Sport, our, our members. In fact, they were lead members at the start. Um, but we also have academic institutions with lots of universities, we have regional and local authorities, our members, um, we have uh, federations of sport and governing bodies of sport, our members, and right down to sports clubs as well, our members. So we've got this very broad membership and we have about 60 or 70 organisations that are members. We, we don't charge a lot for membership, we keep the cost relatively low because we're much more interested in uh, empowering our members to uh, through the network to do work rather than actually doing things ourselves. So although we are an entity, we, we try and uh, empower people and empower our, our members through the network. Um, and that, that's the focus, which is in a sense why it works quite well that we're all volunteers. All of our members have to sign up to a charter um, and, and there are 10 principles within our charter. So I'll not go through them all, um, but we do believe very strongly in the principle of outdoor sport and outdoor recreation for all. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much from cradle to grave type approach and, and through a range of activities. Um, we also believe really strongly in the whole area of environmental awareness and conservation. One of the differences between outdoor sports and many other sports is that we tend to use other people's land or environments uh, for our activities. So uh, if you play football, you do it on a pitch and either your club owns that pitch or maybe it's the local authority owns it and, and you go and you use that pitch. We use uh, other people's land and very often protected areas um, and, and designated lands for our activities. So environmental 
uh, awareness and conservation and sustainability are very much core in our work. Um, and, and, you know, we, 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 we believe in the importance of this sector for developing tourism and, and improving the e economy, particularly in rural areas. And I know that County Clare benefits from, from lots of activity providers who, who uh, operate in that, uh, that area uh, and, and organize outdoor sports activities for tourists, but also for local communities as well. As I mentioned, we, we work quite closely with the, the European Commission um, and we're part of a grouping called the Share Initiative and that brings together a lot of the pan-European sports organizations um, and, and we're focused on, on outdoor sport uh, through that Share Initiative. Uh, and I'll mention that again, just a, a little bit later. So I, I want to talk a, a bit more about this project. This is the benefits of outdoor sports for society project. So at a European Commission level, there is a mechanism for measuring the economic impact of outdoor of, of all sports uh, and particularly outdoor sports. Uh, so there is this mechanism to measure hard economics. So how much people spend on equipment, how much people spend membership of clubs to do the activities on paying coaches or guides and instructors. That sort of information is readily available and there's a standard method to measure that. But what we were interested in was what about the social benefits? What about those community benefits that we get from participating in, in the outdoors? Uh, how can you put an economic value on those benefits? And that was, this, was what this project was all about. So the, 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 the project had three elements to it. So the first thing was really to look at the evidence of what the benefits are of participating in outdoor sports and outdoor recreation. Um, and, and we spent a year doing that, um, finding out just exactly what academic research has been undertaken to show clear benefits from, from being active in, in natural areas. The second stage then was to look at a method to, to put a, a value on those benefits. And the final stage was about testing those benefits. We had 11 partners from our network uh, across seven nations. So there was ourselves in, in Northern Ireland with Sheffield Hallam University uh, from, from uh, England, and then a range of partners from, from across other countries as well. So this, this is quite a, a complex slide, but this, this was the stage one part of the, the, the process where we started to look at what evidence is there that there are benefits, social benefits associated with uh, outdoor sports. And, and we did that by, by searching academic literature and, and our different partners carried out those searches in their own countries. And we also looked at international studies as well. We, we set a criteria for what we were searching for and we actually found over 17 and a half thousand studies um, that had some connection with the outdoors and with sport. Um, we then went into those 17 and a half thousand studies and had a look at which ones were uh, really of importance. And, and we found 133 really high quality studies that showed a distinct link between participating in outdoor sports and some form of uh, social benefit. And we took all of those studies and we've now got a database of the, the key findings from those studies, which is on our website, which I'll, I'll point you to shortly. So what were the key findings in terms of the benefits? And, and some of these will be no surprise. So for example, we know that if you're physically active, uh, there are distinct physical health benefits. So you, you have a reduced risk of diseases like stroke, heart attack, and, uh, and actually significantly cancer as well. Um, it, it, it improves your, your, your long-term life uh, expectancy to be physically active. And that's kind of known for any sport or physical activity. The interesting thing that we find from outdoor sports is that actually those benefits are enhanced when you do your exercise in green environments. So if you go and run on a treadmill in a gym, uh, you'll maybe work at a certain rate and you'll burn off so many calories. If you do the same length of time in, a, in an open environmental setting, in a green setting, you actually burn more calories. And this has been well proven. Um, people actually work harder because they're distracted by the environment. They don't realize that they're working harder. And um, so they get a, a distinctly improved physical health benefits. That was really interesting that we were finding some distinct things uh, about uh, green exercise. The big one that came out for us was the whole area of mental health and well-being. I mean, there's very clear evidence now about the, the 
the benefits of being active in nature and being in nature itself uh, for people's mental health and well-being. And that's come out particularly, we've seen it uh, as a result of the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, where people have reconnected with nature. One of my colleagues in Sport Ireland uh, gave, gave a great quote recently. She said, um, shortly after locked, the first lockdown finished, uh, Ireland woke up and discovered Ireland. Um, and I think that's a really good, uh, a good quote. Another one was the whole area of active citizenship. And, and, and again, this has come out in, in already in, in uh, what we were hearing this morning from Garnia was about those community benefits of connecting people to their, their, their local community, connecting them to their landscape, but also connecting them to each other and forming social bonds. And, and there's, there's very strong evidence for that in terms of being out in nature being and exercising. Outdoor recreation, outdoor sports have been used in terms of education and lifelong learning where participants learn about the environment and, and learn other things as well. Um, and, and then one that's not mentioned here, but we, we'll come back to was that whole area of environmental education and, and connecting people back to the environment. It's also been used for crime reduction and antisocial behaviour, and we did find some additional benefits in terms of uh, the fact that uh, it improves cognitive functioning. Uh, it, it, create opportunities for all to participate. It uh, doesn't matter what age or what ability you have. So these are some of the things that we found through those studies. So, and again, we've got some reports that highlight the detailed benefits and, and exactly just how much uh, the, these benefits can be accrued from, from participating in outdoor sports. So the second stage then was to uh, look at a, a model for measuring the value of these. Um, so, in any project, we, we, we used what is called, uh, like this, we used a, what's called a social return and investment model, uh, where, where you decide what is the scope of the, the project that you're going to measure. Uh, we need to identify who's going to benefit from the, the, the activities and the, the project. Uh, we, we need to engage with those people that are going to benefit uh, and then identify what it is they're going to contribute to the, the project to make it happen uh, or what others are going to contribute to the, the project. So let's take the example I'm going to use a coastal rowing project in County Down here. So we need to find out who the members are of the coastal rowing project. Uh, who supported the coastal rowing project, how, how much support they got from local authorities. Um, then what are the benefits that they actually do get? Do they get all those benefits that I listed or do they only get some of those benefits? And, and then we look at a method for putting values in those and finally report it. So that's the model that we created. And I'll talk you through what we did in practice with that model shortly. So, we then tested that model with, with uh, 12 case studies. I've said 12-ish because we did a pre-pilot case study. The, the coastal rowing project was a, a, a pilot study that we did just to see would the model work before we really tested it on some of the others. We had three projects from Northern Ireland that were tested. So we had Row the Urn uh, in County Fermanagh, which is a community rowing initiative that uses a, a, a 10 meter curra. Uh, and it's a, a little club and it's mostly women over 50. Who, who to participate in that project um, and, and they row on, on Loch Arn. Um, it's, it's very much a social community based thing. I, I don't know if you've heard of Park Run, it's a, it's a big initiative in uh, the UK um, and it's about giving people the opportunity to, to run on, an, on, on timed events in local parks and, and local green spaces. Um, and we set up a, a project called Park Walk, so it was very much about uh, the people who maybe didn't feel comfortable with running or couldn't run um, and to start getting them into uh, physical exercise. And so we used Park Walk as a, as a project. And then, as I mentioned, we, we used the Down Coastal Rowing Project. And I'm going to talk through what we find from the Coastal Rowing Project um, in terms of the values to give you a, a, an example of, of this. Of those 12 projects, all of them were very different and they were chosen for very different reasons. So we had projects in the Alps that were happening uh, in, in wintertime. We, we had projects on the, the coast of Portugal surfing projects. So very, very different sorts of projects. Some involved young people, some involved adults. We had two projects that were focused on people with dis disabilities. Um, we looked at some projects that were short term and some projects like the rowing project, which is a long term project. And, and also, you know, the number of participants involved. So the smallest project had only 14 people. The largest one was a cycling project with over 3000 people. So it was a, a very broad so that we could see did this did this methodology work in a range of settings. Um, so 
then we 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 slightly changed the, the the benefits that we started to look at, and and this was because we found that the whole area of environment was coming out really strongly, connecting people to the environment. So we we looked at that as a distinct area. Uh, across all projects, the one that really stood out was the whole area of community, that sense of community that people got from participating in, in outdoor sports in group settings um, and being involved in, in, a, in, a, in a club or a, in, a, in a project um, came out incredibly strongly. And the friendships and the friendship bonds that were created were, were, were lifelong. Uh, the whole area of mental well-being again was really was really strongly highlighted, as was physical health. But but community, environment, and well health and well-being were the three things that, that stood out really strongly. So the the, the Down Coastal Rowing Project, uh, we looked at that. We have nine clubs uh, involved in this in County Down. It's based on Strangford Lock, which is the largest sea lock in the British Isles. Um, and this was a project that started in 2014. There, there'd been no coastal rowing project on the lock or in the area up before that. And it was an initiative of the Strangford Lock and the Kill Partnership, which is in, in some ways a, a similar sort of organization to Burn Bio. It's about um, the, the place of Strangford Lock and connecting the local communities to the place of Strangford Lock and, and surrounding areas. It's very much uh, based on, on conservation and, and engagement with the natural environment. But one of the things the partnership was quite concerned about was that the local communities were not connected with the water at all. Um, they, they actually almost turned their back on the water. The people who were using the water were generally people from Belfast with quite a lot of sailing clubs on the lock. Uh, and it was people from Belfast coming in and, and using those sailing clubs, but there was almost no connection from the local community. Um, and, and this was an initiative that was set up to build, to create and build traditional boats um, and, and uh, in each of the villages that, that actually sat on the lock. So nine villages got involved. It was hugely successful in terms of connecting the, the, the communities with the project. And there are now 400, or there were at that stage, 418 members. There's actually over 600 now uh, members in the, the, the Coastal Pro Mooring Project. So we sent a survey out to all of those members and, and 217 of those people returned a response. Now that's a really good response rate. And normally if you get about them, um, a 20% response rate, you're really happy. So to get a 52% response rate was great. And, and we asked lots of questions in, in, in the survey, but um, one of the questions that we asked was about uh, how being involved in this project had affected their overall sense of well-being. And 75% and of them stated that it, it had a significant or very significant uh, impact on that sense of well-being uh, through being part of the project. We also ask very standardized questions and validated questions. So the World Health Organization have a, have a system called the WHO-5, World Health Organization, five key questions that look at well-being. And, and we asked the, the participants, you know, those questions prior to getting involved in rowing and then after getting involved in rowing. And what we found was that, they, that there was a 27% increase in well-being from before rowing to after being involved in rowing. So that's really significant. Um, where, where, where getting involved has really made a big difference to them. We also used a, a, a system called PANAS, the positive and negative effective score. So again, this is a, a validated system of questionnaires. And what we found was that the, the members had a, a 3.5 or a 7% higher than average positivity uh, feelings. Uh, and, and, a, and a lower than average negativity feeling. So again, this provided clear evidence that there's that the project was having a positive impact on people's mental health and well-being. We then asked them just about the local environment and, and, and how much knowledge and understanding they'd gained. So this was to, to see had they, um, you know, were they getting sort of educational benefits? So again, you know, we saw that they, they had a, people who participated had a significantly greater understanding of weather and its impacts and about tides. Lots of people said they never really understood the tides. Strangford is a really strong tidal area. In fact, it gets its old Irish name was Coonlock, which means safe harbour, but the Vikings renamed it Strong Fjord. Uh, uh, so the, the, the strong currents at the mouth of the Ford, fjord. Um, so they, 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 they did show that they'd... Um, they understood tides, but we, we asked them about, did they understand maritime charts? And many said they didn't. And so we said, well, that provides a training opportunity for the clubs to actually help their members to understand uh, maritime charts and maps. 
we ask them then, you know, did they feel that they were an important part of a team? Uh, did they feel a strong sense of community? And, and did they feel more connected to their own village or their community? And, and again, we got really strong responses on this, that they, they said that they were significantly connected, not just to the club, but also to their own communities. We also asked them about how they felt about other communities. As you know, Northern Ireland has a, a community relations issue at times, and, and that is ex exemplified in some of our communities around Strangford Lock. We have uh, divided communities, and, and it has really helped the project, has actually helped to break down barriers between uh, some of the villages and some of the communities. Um, so again, that's been, that's been really positive. We asked them then about how they felt about the marine environment and, and Strangford Lock particularly. And again, we got some really positive responses about how the project had connected them to that local environment. And in fact, some of the clubs are now out regularly doing litter picks on islands, um, doing helping with bird counts uh, and helping with, with conservation projects that wouldn't have happened prior to this, this project at all. Um, so, so that's been really positive as well. So there's been, there was clear evidence about the, the, the benefits that these people got in participating. One of the, the questionnaires that we used was again, a standardized uh, questionnaire on nature connectedness. I don't know if you've come across this. It was developed by a guy called Professor Miles Richardson in, in Derby University. And, and it's, been, it's been a way to test, particularly young people, but not just not exclusively young people, how connected people are to nature. So when you get a score from this, you can see uh, whether that's higher than average in the public or, or lower than average. Um, and it asks um, six key questions and then you either strongly agree or disagree with those questions. So we use that project we, or that, that mechanism and, and we think that's a really good mechanism to use. And, and I can share uh, that information in that uh, later on. So the next stage then was to look at, well, what, what, was, what is all of that worth? How do you put a value on these things? It's a really difficult thing to do. Well, the first stage is looking at the physical health uh, benefits. We know that if you uh, achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, then you get a physical health benefit. That's the World Health Organization standard level that you need to achieve to know that you're getting a physical health benefit. So moderate intensity is where you're working at a rate where you can just about hold a conversation. Um, so you're slightly out of breath, your heart rate is raised, uh, but you can still talk, but only just. Uh, vigorous intensity is where you you can't speak, you've got to focus on just breathing. Um, so if you achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week, then you, you get a physical health benefit. We also know from the, the studies that we did that if you do that, if you get that level of intensity, you have a reduced risk of 7% from all forms of cancer. Now, some forms like breast cancer, it actually goes up to about 40%. Um, but, but all forms of cancer, it reduces the risk by 7%. It reduces coronary heart disease by 30%, type 2 diabetes by 10%, depression by 21%, and dementia by 30%. So being physically active, particularly for the life course, uh, is really important. We also know how much each of these things costs to treat. Uh, and we know how many people in society are likely to get these, uh, these, these diseases or 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 conditions. And so you can then put a value on how much benefit your project accrues based on the costs of, of treating them if there's a reduced risk. So we, we find out how many of the participants achieve that 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week through the project. And that's really important. It's through the project or what percentage they gained through the project. Some of our participants had done no physical activity prior to getting involved in the project and we're doing significant amounts now. So I had one lady who was a 54 year old librarian, never done any physical activity in her life and was now rowing two or three times a week um, and, and, and gaining that 150 minutes per week. So we were able to calculate from all of that that our project with those, those 400 odd members were gaining uh, about 71,000 pounds worth of value of physical health benefits and uh, social benefits uh, from, from the healthcare. So that was part one of the measurement. Part two was actually asking the participants themselves what they would be willing to pay to get the benefits that they get from the activity or what they'd be willing to accept. So the way we did it with this project is we said, okay, uh, if we were to if we were to give you something to stop participating in rowing, what would it take? So, if for example, I offered you a new TV 
or a new iPad, would you give up rowing for that new product? Now, obviously, nearly everybody said, no, not a chance. It's only worth 400 quid, 400 euros, whatever. I, I wouldn't give that up for, for, I wouldn't give up rowing for that. And then we went right up to kind of, well, would you give up ro rowing if we were to pay your mortgage off for you or we were to give you a, a, a once in a lifetime holiday and things? And we worked out approximately what the value people started to place on this rowing. Now, lots of people said it was the value was infinite. They couldn't they couldn't put a value on it. But but ultimately, we were able to calculate a, a value from that 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 willingness to pay or willingness to accept. And we worked out overall for the project, it was worth about 160,000 uh, pounds per year uh, for that for that willingness, the participants value, what they placed, what value they placed on it themselves. And finally, we asked others then what they would be willing to invest to achieve the outcomes. So we knew that the project was delivering very positive uh, in, uh, sort of community relations uh, values. So we asked the Northern Ireland Executive Office who run community relations programs, what they would be willing to invest to achieve similar outcomes. And, and they told us that they would be willing to invest in a project like this about 9,000 pounds per year. We also asked the National Trust and the Strangford Lock Partnership who provide grants to communities uh, to engage in programs that connect people with, with nature, what they would be willing to invest to connect people to the natural environment of the lock. And they worked out that it would be around about 20,000 pounds. So in total, with 29,000. So when we added those three elements together, we worked out that the total value uh, that was generated by the project was just over a quarter of a million uh, euros. So then to give you an idea, we asked the clubs how much time and money they spent on, on the projects and on the project themselves. So that was the volunteer time, what they paid for their, their, their membership costs, what they paid for equipment, uh, what they paid for maintenance, what other grants they got. And we put all of that onto the inputs. And then we looked at that, that social value they, they generated. So for every one euro that the clubs invested or others invested in the clubs, this generated uh, a value of 2.37 euros. So what this proves is, when you invest money, you get a very good return for society. If you think about those health benefits, those community benefits, there is clear economic benefit to society. And that was kind of the methodology that we used. And you can see that you could use this for all sorts of projects. It wouldn't necessarily just have to be for, for outdoor sports and outdoor recreation. So that's just a flavor of that project and, 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 and how we've used it. The project has actually been referenced uh, quite, a, quite extensively. The, the European Commission Sport Unit has used it in a publication recently and Sport Ireland have just published their, their uh, policy on the outdoors and they've referenced the project in, in that as well. So that's really welcome that others are, are, are using that. So look, I just want to talk finally uh, for the last couple of minutes on the, the impact of coronavirus uh, on the outdoors and what, what has actually happened. Um, Right at the outset, ENOS as, a, as an organization, as a network, we decided that we thought that it was really important that we create a manifesto for the outdoors and, and highlight, this was before lockdowns had eased, highlight what we thought uh, would be important for society. As people were, were cooped up, we thought connecting people back to nature was gonna be a, a really important thing. So we created this manifesto for outdoor for the outdoors uh, and, and talked about the benefits and the societal benefits that, that being in the outdoors can have. I'll not go into all of that in detail, but, but that manifesto, we sent it to all of the MEPs in Europe and it was really well received and, and again was used uh, a number of times. To give you an idea of, of, of sort of what happened then immediately afterwards, we saw this explosion in people wanting to use natural settings. Now, some of that could have been because other facilities were closed, um, shopping centres were closed, other sports activities were closed, so people were choosing to, to go into the outdoors. But um, we're, not, we're seeing no let up in that. So even when certain things were opened again, people were still using the outdoors and discovering that the, the, these great opportunities around them. So I'll give you an example here. Um, Gosford Forest Park is in County Armagh. It's a, it's a local forest park where there's been new walking and cycling trails put in. Uh, they were put in in 2018. And uh, in 2019, there were 33,000 counters. Uh, people went through the counters. That went up in 2020 to 120,000 people. So saw a 265% increase. So we saw this massive uh, change in the numbers of people using outdoor recreation facilities. Mountain bike trails, we saw significant numbers using those. 
The Blessingbourne one is really interesting. Our other mountain bike trails are free to use, but Blessingbourne, you have to pay for it. It's a private estate and you pay for it. the numbers using it in 2019 were pretty low. Um, but actually people were willing to pay to go and use it in 2020 and it increased by over a thousand percent. So, so some really interesting statistics there. But a lot of the people who were starting to use our natural places did, had no experience of it and didn't realize maybe that, that, they, that there, were, there were issues with, with uh, the impact that they could have. And, and certainly we saw significant problems with litter and disturbance of wildlife and, and, um, and, and, and even just disturbance of, of farming practices and things. We had previously developed uh, 10 principles in protected areas with our partners called the Europark Federation. Europark Federation is the network of all the protected areas in Europe. So it's an environmental organization. It, it, it represents sort of national parks, nature reserves, those sorts of things. So, so we developed these 10 principles and we, we were working very closely with Europark to promote these. In fact, just before lockdown last year, we held a conference in Brussels where we, we brought together the head of the EU sport unit. That's the guy on the left side of the, the picture there, Eve Lustig. Um, and the, the guy on the right side is the head of the environment unit in the European Commission. Neither of these two people had met each other before. So we, we ran this conference and, and, and invited both of them to speak at it. Um, that's me on the, the left beside Eve. And then the lady beside uh, the guy from the environment unit is, is Carol Ritchie, who's the director of Europark Federation. And, and so we brought them together and, and said, look, let's work in partnership to promote these principles. But that's a really challenging thing to do because many people who participate in the outdoors do so independently. They're not necessarily part of a club or a group. So how do you get that information to them? So what we've been doing is we've been promoting it through webinars and events, but we're also working in partnership with uh, an organization called the European Outdoor Group, which represents all of the manufacturers of the equipment. So when you buy a, a new fleece or a pair of boots or a waterproof jacket, uh, the company that's made that is probably a member of the European Outdoor Group. So we're now working with them about getting those messages embedded into the equipment that, that is being bought. And we hope to start doing that from, from next year. So that gives you a little bit of insight into who we are in Enos, what we do. This is our website, outdoorsportsnetwork.eu. Um, feel free to visit it. Uh, we'll, we can send around the, or pop the, the, the website into the chat maybe. Um, have a look at that. And you, there are links there to our, our boss project as well. And I can certainly send uh, links through to uh, Grania about the boss project if folk want to follow up on that, or by all means, pass on my email and, and folk can follow up, up on that as well. Guys, that's it from me. That was, uh, I feel that was quite long-winded, uh, but hopefully I, I got through it in the time allocated okay. You absolutely did. That was great. Um, I actually found that really interesting. I thought it was, um, it was it's fascinating to know, um, and it's something that I, you know, th that isn't surprising to me, but that sense of community that can be built um, from participating in a sport. I mean, I've had that myself, but more from indoor sports teams that I've been involved in. Um, and I suppose from just one uh, comment we had from Joan Kavanagh was that she was surprised golf is not included um, and we still have the, uh, the, the environment and benefits of physical and mental health. And I suppose, you know, you have to limit your, well, maybe you can speak to this, but maybe you have to kind of, you know, limit the. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. We, we need to limit our scope in terms of, 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 of what are considered outdoor sports. There are lots of sports that take place in the outdoors. But, but aren't necessarily outdoor sports. One of our key criteria is that it's not about a, an object, it's about actually dealing with the environment itself. So golf, the focus is getting a ball in a hole, whereas mountaineering is about climbing to the top of the mountain or canoeing is about going down the river or along the coastline. It, it is one of those things. And also golf courses are, they are green, but they're actually physically built. It's like a pitch um, and we don't include things where there is a pitch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's clearly a sport. It clearly has benefits. You know, there's no question about that. But in terms of what we do, we, we think more about the, 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 the sports that connect people to, to nature deliberately. But, um, yeah. Uh, do, you want, do you want me to answer some of these questions? Oh, first, yeah, yeah. So uh, someone has asked there, uh, Barbara's asked when it was carried out. So we started it in 2017 and, and finished mm -hmm. it at the end of 2019, just beginning of 2020. So it was a three year project. Um, and it definitely has informed policy. Uh, as I mentioned, Sport Ireland have, have referenced it and actually they used our definition in their new policy on the outdoors. Uh, and, and the European Commission have used it in a new policy position paper 
on what is called the European Bauhaus uh, Initiative, which is about, it's very much about greening up uh, cities and uh, urban spaces and, and getting people back to nature. And it's been significantly re uh, referenced in that uh, European Bauhaus uh, project as well. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, it's, it is something we, we, we are really keen to keep working on and to, to get people to, we created a toolkit so anybody can actually use the methodology. Um, it is quite complicated to do, as you probably saw, and it takes a bit of time, but there is a toolkit there. There's also a question bank, so all of the questions that you would want to put in surveys are available, that, and, and all the validated standardized questions are available as well. Um, in terms of it being replicated in other places, there are other projects that are looking at similar social return on investment uh, methodologies. Uh, it's well recognized by governments, social return on investment. It's, I think it's been, it's really worth doing because it does make our politicians sit up and think. But not only that, it, you can use it to tell a story. So it's not just about the economic benefits, it's actually about the, the, the telling the story of the social benefits that are actually created. And sometimes just the individuals whose lives have been changed that, that you capture information on that. Brilliant. Brilliant, that's great. Mike, I don't know if you can see um, the question and answer bit as well, but there's, um, one other question from Liam, who said, Hi, Mike, thanks for the opportunity. It's fascinating how the value can be placed on various benefits. Any idea how Stormont came up with a value of £9,000 for the cross community benefits of this project? In my humble opinion, cross community har uh, harmony is priceless. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so we went to the, 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 the Northern Ireland Cross Community Council um, and we said, If you were going to run a project for a year, with about 400 participants, and, and, and those, these were the benefits you wanted to accrue, what would you be willing to give as a grant to a community to actually do that? And they said, so they give us examples of other projects that they'd run in, other, in lots of different areas. And so the average grant that we worked out was working out at around about 9,000 uh, pounds or euros, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, it's a really good question, you know, it is priceless. And, 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 that is the difficulty with any of these, you know, some of the figures that we were very conservative with the figures, um, very, very conservative. We were very cautious not to overinflate. That's one of the principles of social return and investment methods. Um, in reality, you know, uh, you, you could have almost doubled or tripled those figures very easily, but we were, we, we went on the very conservative side. Yeah. Brilliant. There's, there's just one other question, Mike, um, and I think we might make this the last the last question, um, and it's from uh, it's in the Q and A. So this sounds like an amazing amazing pro project, and it's brilliant to have the evidence, which which it is. Um, how common do you think the focus on environmental learning and connection is in outdoor sports generally? Um, <laughs> is the experience from the study uh, examples reflective of the wider society, or is it you know? Can you speak a little on that, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the 12 projects that we looked at, um, many of them involved young people, about half of them at least involved young people. Definitely the, 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 the clubs and the organizations running those projects saw, you know, we're very focused on connecting people to the environment, but we don't see that necessarily across all sports. And so the next project that we've actually just started, and it's actually being led by one of our members, which is Leave No Trace Ireland, um, which I'm sure you know of, mm -hmm. um, based in Westport. Uh, is, is looking at the whole area of sustainability and environmental education in outdoor sports. So we're looking at the high outdoor sports federations and training organizations train up their guides, leaders and instructors in environmental issues. So we're, we're, we're actually seeing, have they embedded those training programs into their leadership training? So when you train to be a, a, a sea kayak guy, and layering guide you know do you learn do you learn how to impart good environmental ethics as part of that we're right at the start of the project we, we have 10 partners from across europe looking at that and it was very much a follow-up to what some of the stuff we talked about in boss it was a key area that we wanted to look at so it's an it's a new erasmus plus project that we're we're, we're so come come back to me in three years and i'll give you the answer <laughs> That's fascinating that's really that's brilliant to hear yeah that that'll be um important important work um, thanks a million, Mike. Thanks for coming on this morning. And just to let everyone know, I've been recording um, Mike's um, presentation and we're definitely going to put it on our YouTube channel um, in the coming weeks. So it'll be available there and we'll, we'll make it available through our Facebook page. And uh, just to let you all know, at two, we have William Mac and Lenny uh, coming on 
um, or sorry, at one o'clock, at one o'clock, um, I'll be giving my usual um, uh, slides at the start. So um, I suppose we'll, we'll probably kick off at about 10 past one for that. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to launch a, a, sh a quick poll just to kind of uh, get people's feedback. And um, after that, I'll end the meeting. So thanks a million, Mike. Thanks for everything. And thanks. My to pleasure. And, and, and I really look forward to being back over in the Burren, uh, hopefully either later this year or next year. It'd be great. Yeah. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Long.